uh, namaste and welcome kendra karen and nancy uh, to ahimsa conversations thank you so much for making the time and uh, i have uh, been following the idea of the department uh, of peace in the usa for a very long time i actually heard about it for the first time uh, after 9/11 uh when i saw a poster somewhere uh which was appealing uh i think it was uh, giving the names of many of the family members who had lost loved ones in that attack and they were appealing for a department of peace and uh, and i know that the idea has taken many forms over about say 200 years so if one of you could just very briefly walk us through the history of this idea and what does it mean today to what would a department of peace look like if it were if it became a legislated uh, reality so i'm going to start with the history and i'm going to call on nancy next to tell what the department of peace would look like today if it if it passed um my name is kendra mon I'm a member of the National Committee for the Department of Peace Building and also of the Peace Alliance. I came to peace building as a protester against war and capital punishment and then later as a parent learning communication skills. My father was career military and my mother was a civil rights activist and I I think they were both about preserving peace. So the history goes way back, as you said, Rajni, um, in the 1790s, shortly after our nation won independence on the battlefield, two of our founding fathers called for an office of peace and President George Washington, the first president of the United States, supported a cat, an academy of peace. And I'm, I'm interweaving uh, international um, peace. In 1920, the League of Nations was founded at the end of the First World War to maintain peace and prevent war. In 1935, the first legislation to create a Department of Peace was submitted to the US Congress. Since legislation that fails to be enacted must be reintroduced every two years, there have been more than 100 such attempts over the years to create a Department of Peace. In 1945, the United Nations was founded. In 2001, the UN declared the International Decade for the Culture of Peace and Nonviolence for the Children of the World from 2001 to 2010. And in 2001, the modern version of the Department of Peace legislation that you mentioned, Rajni, you seeing a poster about, was introduced in the US Congress before 9-11 um, by Representative Dennis Kucinich, and it emphasized the importance of creating a culture of peace within our own nation, as well as in dealings with other nations. It also called for an academy of peace. The name of the legislation has been changed by its current sponsor, Representative Barbara Lee, to Department of Peace Building, which I, I think just underscores that it's a process, not a product. In 2004, the Peace Alliance was created to focus on proactive approaches to cultivating peace and support the Department of Peace legislation. Later, um, the Peace Alliance expanded its focus to additional peace building efforts and legislation. So in 2010, the National Committee was formed to create, to continue the campaign. The Peace Alliance website has more information about its resources, events, and advocacy, 
at peacealliance.org, as well as information about our committee and its work. And then in 2005, the first International People's Summit for Departments of Peace was held in 2000 in, in London. The name of the organization was later changed to the Global Alliance for Ministries and Infrastructures of Peace, or GAMEP, by the letters. The next GAMEP Summit will be held in Colombia in October of this year. And you can learn more about that and the organization at its website, gamep.org. GAMEP offers peace courses, speakers, and is working with the coalition to develop a UN resolution to go before the UN General Assembly asking member nations to establish offices or infrastructures of peace in their own countries. So I'm gonna call on Nancy to tell us about what's in the legislation. Thank you so much. Thank you, Kendra. Yes, Nancy, over to you. Uh, sorry, Nancy, uh, you have to unmute. Uh, details. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Rajni, for inviting Thank us you. to Thank this you. conversation. We, we really appreciate the opportunity to talk about this with you. Um, my name is Nancy Merritt, and I live in the San Francisco Bay Area in California. And I've been involved. I've always... Um, I've always been interested in politics and peace and um, history and um, have have uh, that led me over the years to finally be involved with the Department of Peacebuilding campaign in 2004. I've been involved with that campaign since then. And um, I think I do this really for my children and to create a better world for our, our future generations. And uh, so we thank you again for letting us talk with you. Um, I'll talk a little bit about uh, uh, an overview of the bill. It's quite comprehensive. So I'll just give some, some highlights. Um, one definition of ahimsa I saw was non-injury and never producing pain um, by thought, word, or deed in any living being. And uh, nonviolence is described as love and action by a Meta Center in California. This is very much what a Department of Peace Building is about. Um, it's about preventing violence, bringing a culture of peace, looking at the root causes of violence, and promoting the root conditions of peace. Uh, the bill is a historic and transformative piece of legislation calling for a cabinet level Department of Peace building to make peace a much, much needed national and ongoing focus in our country. It addresses the interconnection of all life and the intersectionality of peace, justice, equality, planetary survival, and other aspects of life. It is about healing and building bridges, not walls. In uh, various incarnations of the modern day bill that Kendra spoke about, um, it's been called the Department of Peace, the Department of Peace of, and Nonviolence, and the Department of Peace Building. And uh, interestingly, uh, you mentioned the poster and seeing this right after 9-11, uh, this bill was introduced exactly two months before 9-11. So we like to think, what if, what if this had, bill had been in place? We could have probably prevented a lot of 9-11s, a lot of shootings, a lot of wars, uh, a lot of other kinds of violence. Um, there are numer numerous references to nonviolence and violence reduction throughout the entire bill. Um, let me turn to some of the uh, some of the segments. It calls for our Secretary of Peace Building um, to sit at the table of our government and to advise the president in an ongoing way. So this is very important. Cabinet level position. 
cabinet level position, um, very important to have that cloud and that presence, that voice um, every day to look to look at uh, to look at our policy through that lens we aren't uh, necessarily getting that lens right now um, its mission is to cultivate peace and peace building as a strategic national policy uh, to reduce and prevent violence and to proactively research develop and promote best practices and policies to achieve these goals so to do that, the bill is broken into several different offices, um, including peace education and training, domestic peace building, international peace building, technology for peace, arms control and disarmament, peace building information and research, and uh, human rights and economic rights. And it also calls for um, an intergovernmental advisory council on peace and a federal agency, interagency to connect all the uh, different parts of government um, on what's, what's happening in the field of peace throughout the government. And it calls for a US commission on truth, racial healing and transformation, which is huge, a huge issue in our country. Um, it will promote and uh, research best practices and policies. Um, it will uh, help with the uh, development and um, dissemination of peace education programs and curriculum. And uh, it will develop violence prevention and violence de-escalation, um, not only in schools, but for the community at large. Our children need to learn this and we need to learn this. <laughs> so um, that part, and then there will be grant monies to help do this. Um, so to me, the most, most important and fundamental is the peace education and training because I, I think we need to start with our children. Um, so part of that will be uh, peace education to include anti-harassment, anti-bullying, social emotional learning, uh, mindfulness, uh, compassion, restorative practices, dialogue and mediation training. Um, and in this country, um, our, our peace education should also include uh, the study of the US civil rights movement, uh, human rights and liberties movements and and contributions in our country um, of, the, of our diverse ethnicities, races, and religious communities, and environmental stewardship. So um, it's pretty comprehensive. Um, in the domestic peace building, it will address school violence, gang violence, police violence, hate crimes, economic injustice, uh, human trafficking, and things like that. Um, in the international sector, it will advise the president on um, ways to prevent or to, to spot and to prevent um, violence from uh, conflict from escalating into violence. Um, it will also uh, talk about preventing or reducing violence through eradication of extreme hunger, infectious diseases, poverty, genocide. Uh, dehumanization and mistreatment of individuals and human trafficking. So from this, just a little bit, you can see yeah. how comprehensive it is. Um, so I, with that, I'll turn it, I wanted to mention that um, over 250 organizations also support this and uh, 47 uh, cities, counties, and tribes in the U.S. support this. And um, with that, I'll, I'll turn it back to, um, I think Karen's gonna go next. Um, yeah, thank you so much, thank you so much. Um, right. So welcome, Karen. Um, um, as uh, Nancy was speaking, I, I was you know thinking ahead of what are the challenges that you're all struggling with in this work? Because um, there is very, uh, clearly evidence of violence fatigue in Amer American society. Um, and I, I, I see evidence of that just from, you know, even from this great distance following uh, through media and, and the other networks that one is uh, connected to 
um, that there is a large volume of people in America who are just fed up uh, with the everyday violence itself. And of course, um, the, the pain and the grief of the random, you know, the shootings, that is unspeakable. Um, so, in, and yet we also know that the, you, you continue to face a very tough uphill battle on a simple, what seems from a distance like a simple thing to us uh, in other countries, you know, gun control. Um, so I don't want to preempt what you're going to say, but I just wanted to uh, ask you in this large context, what are the challenges that the campaign faces? Um, sorry, Karen, you're on mute. Ah, yeah, thank you. same thing. I, Nancy and I are so much alike. Shout <laughs> out to all of us. Yes, go ahead. <laughs> Welcome. Yeah, thank you. And let me just say, I'm from the Midwest and the Chicagoland area. So we've got both coasts in the Midwest represented between the three of us. Not intentionally, but that's just the way it's worked out now. Uh, sorry, Nancy, um, before you go ahead, can you slightly lower your camera so we, we see all of you? Just a little bit. Yeah, great. Okay, thank you. I love the poster you have at the back. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Um, yeah, so the challenge is really, uh, like you mentioned, with everything going on in the world, there's um, a couple aspects of that, that, that people are, um, a good segment of the population is focused on their own lives and their families, and don't have a lot of time to go out and look at where the solutions and so forth. And, um, and then again, with gun violence, it's become too much of a norm in the United States. And uh, while uh, really since 2018 and the uh, the shootings in Florida and so many students who were in that high school becoming active and, and so forth and, and keeping it somewhat top of mind, at least in the activist community, uh, it still hadn't made a lot of progress. So uh, many of us are cautiously hopeful uh, about since this last a large shooting in Texas and certainly shooting since then, uh, that uh, more people uh, are are going to keep standing up until something shifts. And we've seen at least a shift in the, the willingness to, in, to communicate in our members of Congress on this issue. So that's that's very hopeful. As as Nancy, you know, pointed out some of the the undersecretaries in the bill, the areas of responsibility, I look at it that anything in our society that has the potential to lead to violence is going to be somebody's responsibility with a, a Department of Peace building. Uh, so again, we have the, the Secretary of Peace at the cabinet level, but we also have people that are focusing on these different aspects of having a peaceful society where everyone has a chance uh, to reach their full potential and how do we make incre incremental change. So always looking for the challenges and the opportunities on what's the next thing that can change. So uh, looks like we're going to make some kind of step forward on gun violence. Uh, but then there, like I say, there'd be somebody looking at this on a regular basis. We also have um, the violence in the schools with the students. So there are a lot of good school programs that can be replicated and and uh, um, restorative justice programs and so forth that help keep juveniles from getting into trouble. Um, but, you know, in some of these peace circles, um, you know, might uncover some of the situations that lead to children uh, getting guns and shooting. So there are a lot of different programs that can stop things before they happen. Um, but uh, overall, the challenges um, kind of fall into a couple of categories. One is getting the word out, getting education to people about what a Department of Peace Building is and what some of the programs are that we would consider violence reduction and peace building, uh, you know, like Peace Circles, Restorative Justice, uh, Mediation, etc. Um, having health services, human health services, mental health services available to everybody. Um, it just also, there are still a lot of people who think 
that violence is a natural part of being a human being. You know, especially depending on what you grew up with in your family system, your neighborhood system, what zip code you're living in in the United States. There's a there's a different reality and cultural norm um, for all of us. And to to really look at uh, um, new ways of thinking and relating and being in empathy with each other. So we've got the education with the grassroots. We've got our organizational issues, like how many people do we have available and to do what at any given time over <laughs> um, the decades, two decades now that we've been working on this. Um, and then, of course, what are the member of Congress concerns? And and also with with some of the people, it's interesting what I noticed even, you know, 15 years ago when I started working on the campaign and I started traveling around my state and having conversations with people, people usually have um, kind of a, a knee jerk reaction on whether they think it's a good idea or not. And when I've asked people, what do they think it is, the people who have not read the bill? Um, the people who are for it right away have a pretty good idea of the essence of what the bill is about. Uh, the people who think it's never going to happen or it's not the right thing generally have some kind of misperception um, or fear around what it is. There's still this fear of the peace police where where people will somehow get in trouble um, for uh, being the way they are in some way you know, somehow making them wrong, um, which is interesting because it, it almost implies a level of consciousness about the level of violence in their own life, you know, and uh, perhaps that's an opening for education on, on what can be different. Yeah. yeah. You know, this raises a very interesting question and I invite a, any one of you to, to take a shot at it. Oops, I didn't mean to say that. <laughs> 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 uh, that how do you grapple with that thing which you just said Karen that many people believe that uh, violence is sort of more natural now uh, I, I'm sure you've all been following the research because both the natural and the social sciences have produced a lot of knowledge and wisdom on this theme over the last 30, 40 years, which is showing us, if nothing else, that both the violent impulse and the urge for nonviolence are natural to human beings, right? We also have research which is showing that actually militaries find it much harder to train people to kill compared to how easy it is to train people for nonviolent action. Mm -hmm. So, uh, in this larger context, what is your experience on the ground with people who, who feel that violence is more natural? And as you said, that's a very fascinating thing you just said about a fear of a kind of peace police, uh, particularly at a time when so much of the so-called entertainment and gaming uh, infrastructure is glorifying violence, is presenting violence as entertainment. Um, so I would just love to hear your reflections on this, all of you. Yeah. Well, I'll, I'll speak to how I usually respond, and then I thought we all might have our own perspective. Sure, sure. You go, you go first, yeah. Karen, and then yeah, I usually respond to people yes. in, in a couple of ways, depending on how they framed it that conflict is inevitable, but violence is not. Right. And how we respond to violence when it erupts in ourselves, if, you, if we have a, an urge for something violence to look at that and behave in a different way, that there are different ways like uh, nonviolent communication. There's a Center for Nonviolent Communication that can actually train you to look at that and um, refers to that inner voice that um, uh, comes up as a jackal and how to take that jackal thinking and turn it into giraffe communication, which is the animal on the planet with the biggest heart. So bring it into heart communication. Um, but also, uh, you know, once you've shifted your perspective and so forth, um, I also talk about that this is, this is an evolution for individuals, for the human race, and for governments to, to look at this. We're not saying that 
All right, a Department of Peace passes um, on Monday and on Tuesday, we're all, we all know what to do. <laughs> you know? Um, so we're not saying war is going to stop overnight. You know, and certainly with Ukraine, we've seen uh, a leader be aggressive um, uh, just because he can. And, and, and somebody might disagree with that, but, you know, they're, you know, they're not predictable things in the world. And sometimes um, you have to meet violence with violence to some extent. But there are also lots of studies about um, nonviolent resistance um, on a uh, citizen level and so forth. And some of that is happening in the Ukraine as well, even as yeah. the, yes. the military it response. Is of it also. Even the mainstream media has got photos of some of it. Yeah, yeah. So there's there's lots of opportunity for us to shift year by year, decade by decade into a place where, um, you know, that's the ultimate security and safety is when we have these skills and we can apply them on a daily basis. And I grew up in a home of domestic violence, so I often will relate my own um, experience that what was normal in our household, even, you know, as children, you know, when something doesn't feel right and feel good, but you could become conditioned to it. And everybody has, can be in the same situation and come out in a different way. So my piecework and my family work, my personal recovery from violence, as I, as I phrase it, um, are all kind of intertwined. And so when I learn how to relate in one of those forums, it, it affects how I relate in one of the others. And so I've been really um, uh, grateful for my uh, evolution and the relationships in all aspects of my life as a as a part of just studying this and practicing it, having a, a forum in which to practice and to become um, more and more peaceful and less and less violent. So Nancy, something came up for you right away. I'll let you yes, know. please. Yeah, um, I, I just wanted to tell a story about one time when we were in Washington, D.C. at the Capitol building advocating for this bill. Um, we, several people from the Department of Peace building campaign happened to get in the same elevator with a group of generals. Um, so there were like maybe four of them with all their ribbons and decorations and all, you know, their military stance and all that. And then on the other side of the elevator was our group and um, it got very quiet. <laughs> and uh, then at one point, one of the generals uh, uh, turned to our group and said, well, why are you here? And uh, nobody was sure what to say. <laughs> but then uh, somebody said, well, we're here to work for a Department of Peace building. And again, it got very quiet. And then one of the generals turned to us and said, hurry, hurry. And that, that said to me that those people, the high ranking military people understand and know what violence is. They know what it means to commit to going to war and they know the importance of preventing that and working with their so-called soft power as uh, one of our secretaries of uh, defense des described the importance of soft power and working to prevent violence. So yeah, that, that to me was a really, that story always stands out in my mind. That's yeah, that's, uh, that's a very, very good example. Uh, I have a question, but I'm going to wait till we've heard from Kendra. Well, I, I was just interesting, interested that you, Rajni, were struggling for the right word, the, the, the nonviolent word. And, and we do that all the time. I, I often say we're, we aim for this or, or we target this. And I, or impact. I, we want impact. Yeah, so I'm struggling the same as you. And, yeah. and then what Karen said about, um, and Nancy actually said, we're, we're, we're supporting um, collecting these new stories, different stories that, from the violent stories. And um, through Karen's help, we recently hosted um, Rivera's son with this book, The Way Between. 
And what she does is create a different story. Yes. And the Meta Center for Nonviolence is also about creating new story and collecting all of these stories. So I think that's what we need to do. Rivera has been on Ahimsa Conversations. Oh, good. Um, yeah, yeah. I'll send you the link to her uh, talk uh, tomorrow. Oh, great. Yeah. Great. Thank you. great. No, so, you know, the, the meeting with the general brings home the big, uh, what shall we say, the bear in the room or the elephant in the room that how do all of the collective efforts across the world for peace contend with the power of the political economy of violence, right? Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, the atomic scientists, what is it called? Uh, uh, you know, the people who run the doomsday clock. Mm -hmm. I, I, their name, uh, I think it's the uh, Association of Atomic Scientists. Uh, and they run a journal, they run a bulletin. They've been also working now for what, since the war, Second World War. Uh, and that doomsday clock just keeps moving seconds and you know, okay, it, I know it moved, it improved a little bit after the Cold War officially ended, but um, we really haven't got at, on a global scale, I think substantial reduction in the arms industry. I mean, of course, there is the gain that many countries chose consciously not to go for nuclear weapons, even though they could make them or they could buy them if they wanted to. It's not that they are too poor, but they have chosen not to do so. And yet, somehow that gets overwhelmed by the number of countries that not only have weapons, but have weapons enough to destroy the world many times over. So how do we deal with this? Um, you know, because in the world of, what shall we say, the non-activist world, Many people turn to me and say, oh, you're this all lovely. We are so happy that, you know, you have so many friends who work for peace. But what does it add up to, you know, more and more weapons are being made. Um, so I can share what I say to them, but I first want to hear how you respond to this. Yeah, thank you. And, and that's another aspect where there's an undersecretary just focusing on on that, uh, on the nuclear weapons. And, and there's also uh, the issue of, of space weapons. You know, that's, that's an emerging concern yeah. uh, and trying to do something ahead of time instead of having some kind of uh, traumatic event um, for us and then going from there. Uh, so I think that's, it, it comes down to, like you say, everybody's focused on different things in their lives. A lot of people don't think about it. There are some activists that are focused just on that issue. But to me, again, it's having the full department that is a comprehensive aspect of all of the things in our society and our world that affect um, our level of peace and, and safety and security. And having somebody with some expertise looking at that and looking for what are our next steps. Um, and it's, uh, I remember reading something with uh, when the uh, Obama was president that I was a bit disappointed about, but there was some aspect of once you've got these weapons, you've got to maintain them in some way. It's not yeah. um, simple to just say, okay, let's decommission. You can't just leave them in the closet. Yeah, so there's the maintenance on them. Uh, and so when it's time for that decision, just like our, our arms control domestically, gun control, there's there's so much of a lobby against that. And so, yeah, we, we've had this warning in our country. I think it was Roosevelt who warned us about the military industrial complex. We have so much uh, corporate money uh, and jobs Honestly, you know, I've, I've seen that in conversations that a lot of these corporations are lobbying these Congress people and remembering how many people in their district they're employing. Um, so it's, it's about um, transferable skill sets, <laughs> you know, 
as we look at how do we evolve from uh, an economy based on violence and destruction into one that's uh, based on uh, peace and prosperity, how do we make those transitions? And we've seen that with coal, that that's something that you would think is it's getting to be a no brainer, but it's not there yet that coal is is not the best use of our resources, even if we can still mine some. But the people who have made their living generation after generation, it's, it's hard for those communities. So we have to have a, a community plan, you know, that uh, that empathy for what individuals and groups of individuals are going through as we change the way we do things and see things. So that's that's my perspective is it's not it's not one simple act. It's connected to so many other cogs in the wheel. And and yeah, and that's one of the challenges we were you know going to talk about is just the money. You know, they say follow the money, but there are a lot of different implications about the people who are making money off of what's happening now. That's why I'm I'm very hopeful and watching if we can make some kind of progress this year and hopefully even more progress next year with the the assault rifles that end up in our schools, because that's that's got me at a gut level for 20 years now. And I it's, it's just past time to make progress. Yeah. So, you know, at this distance. Um, I'm, I'm just telling you how America looks from where I am. Uh, the, 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 the common story is that there's so much money behind the gun industry, that that is what is preventing uh, a powerful upsurge for that, you know, of people who want change, uh, but that change is being prevented because of the money behind the gun industry is it that simple or is there something more no and then i think it's the propaganda that they create that we have so many people that believe things you know they've made this about the second amendment and the right yes. to bear arms so, that, so that's actually what i'm asking that is it really uh, to what extent is it the money power and therefore the lobbying power of the gun industry and to what extent is there a an issue within American society where, I, as you know, one of you said, um, many people believe that uh, to be turned away from violence completely is to lose something of themselves. Uh, which of these factors is uh, more predominant? Or is it a kind of an egg and chicken? It's difficult to say what comes first. I think the money... Nancy. The money is a huge issue. Uh, the National Rif Rifle Association has way outsized power. Um, they have lobby lobbyists all over Congress. They, uh, you know, they give money to campaigns um, way more than the peace movement can afford or has the capacity to do. And, uh, and they spin the story too because it's really not about the second amendment if you really look at it. Um, when we're trying to prevent gun violence, um, most people are saying, yeah, it's, it's okay to own a gun if you do, do that responsibly. I personally, it doesn't make sense to me, but <laughs> you know, um, I, think, I think the statistic is, is there are 1.2 guns for every single, person in America, every person. I was on a call the other day with somebody who said she used to be married to a man who had 50 guns, 50. And I said, what is he so afraid of that he thinks he needs 50 guns? So I don't know, I, I, it's just, um, and like Karen said, it just tears your heart out um, when you see we're still dealing with this. like. Sandy Hook uh, school years ago when six-year-olds were shot, six-year-olds really? And the one just now with 12, you know, 10 and 12 year olds, I, I don't know. It's just sad, but um, I, I think we have to get the political will. And I think this is all also part of our, just our fatigue problem. There's so much going on in, uh, violence on so many levels, so many issues, violence against women, out of control, violence against violence and bullying in schools, out of control. Um, 
just all of it. And so I, I think that's, I think that's part of it. Then and the nuclear weapons issue. Um, I mean, it used to be years ago, millions of people would show up in the streets to protest yeah. uh, nuclear weapons. And now people barely think about it. So, yeah, the yeah. issue has kind of fallen off the, the, the view screen in some ways. Yeah, and it's huge, <laughs> you know, but like, you know, there's so many issues, so many issues. Yeah. Kendra, do you want to respond in some way to this issue? Different things that people said um, sparked other thoughts. Um, and now I have to try to remember them. <laughs> and um, no, I'm basically that, you know, uh, I, I was requesting you to comment on the dynamic between the money part of it, that, you know, there is so much money pushing uh, for the uh, proliferation of guns uh, versus what is the social and psychological climate uh, that is, you know, making people resist change? Well, uh, two things that came up right now. One is that when somebody said, Guns beget guns. And some people, when there's a threat of eliminating personal guns, go out and buy more guns. And some people are now afraid of people who have guns. Um, we were looking to travel and we saw that the our, where we live now, Florida, is uh, considered a very conservative state, pro-gun, but they don't have an open carry law. I don't know if you know about that, Rajni. The, but we look around where we might travel. Every state around us has open carry laws where they are allowed legally to carry weapons publicly in restaurants and public places. And that goes all the way up to um, Virginia, Kentucky, um, Indiana, West Virginia, um, and all the Southern states except Florida, which is interesting, but I, I, I am, a little reluctant now to travel in, in these states where um, people can carry guns. I'm not gonna go buy one, but I can, I can understand that some people are frightened enough that they think that if they have their own personal guns, they'll protect themselves. Yeah. What about the violence as entertainment uh, uh, you know, issue? Um, is that something that the Peace Alliance is trying to tackle? Because that does play a role in, in, in kind of the, the base uh, on which, or rather it does play a role in setting the atmosphere. Yeah, normalizing and, and uh, conditioning us. Yeah. No. I know scientifically it remains a controversy, you know, about whether or not uh, playing these very violent video games does or does not cause people to actually uh, become violent in real life. I, I know that in a literal sense, that issue is unsolved, uh, but surely it contributes to the overall atmosphere of, I mean, does it glamorize violence? Yeah. And it, and it kind of reminds me of, and not to minimize it, you know, in the 60s and 70s where, you know, rock and roll was feared about how it was going to corrupt the children, you know. So it's it's almost become, um, you know, a community or a family by family kind of thing on what you allow your children to be exposed to, to the extent that you can control it. Um, so I, I think the Peace Alliance may, just because as issues come up, they'll put out 
an action item or an email about that concern. So I, I don't know that we've, um, as an organization, uh, spent a lot of time on that particular issue. I think there's just a lot of other actions that we can take around communicating with our members of Congress. Um, but I, yeah, it certainly is a factor among several that uh, is a concern for you know, a couple of generations already that have grown up on on violent video games and and movies and so forth. And and uh, I suppose I'll let somebody else speak to that because I, I, I don't go to those movies. I just don't, it doesn't feel good to me. So <laughs> I'm not, it's not top of mind for me. Sure. Nancy or Kendra, do you know, want to say more about that? What movies are you talking about, Karen? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I mean, I, I think that Bill addresses this a, a bit in our, uh, there's a research and information portion to the bill and uh, calling on the media to uh, be responsible. And um, I think also countering, countering the message of violence with uh, peace news or emphasizing um, what does work, some of the good things that are happening, uh, teaching peace history in our schools, um, uh, Rivera Sun's book, you know, putting out, putting out things that counter that. There used to be a game about saving the whales, which was a collaborative effort, uh, very different than most competitive games. So I, I think, I think we have to approach this on every level, really. Yeah, and dancing actually comes to mind as I hear you say that. You know, the dance game videos and so forth. And I remember my niece, who's now a teacher, and when she was visiting the first time from college, and she was an A student, and she was just taken aback by how different and hard college was. And she talked about how she and her new friends would just dance it out, you know, dance the stress out. Yeah. So um, yeah, there are alternative forms of dealing with the stress of society. Yeah. So before we close, uh, could each of you sum up your hopes for the Department of Peace, uh, mm -hmm. you know, for in your lifetime and um, beyond your lifetime, how do you, uh, you know, how do you see? I'm not asking for a prediction, but rather more a kind of, you know, what keeps you going? Because uh, it is a very uphill uh, effort. Kendra? Yeah. Oh, okay, go ahead. No, go ahead. Uh, but I thought Kendra was ready. Go ahead, Kendra, please. I, I don't anticipate that the bill will pass in my lifetime. I'm 80 years old, um, but I have already seen changes in schools, especially, and with restorative practices in schools. And that gives me so much hope. I, I think of these um, multiple shooters as being, um, if they were in a a school with restorative practices, with restorative circles um, every day, they would not feel left out. They would not feel um, marginalized. I think they would feel included and they would not have those thoughts to um, make a name for themselves by shooting classmates. So that all gives me hope. Thank you. Karen. Yeah, um, I have seen changes. I, what comes to mind immediately is the complex crisis fund that was uh, started a few years ago. So as we're um, even just raising awareness with the members of Congress is invaluable. So we keep having meetings and conversations and, and talking about this. The the uh, uh, objections or the concerns are changing over the years where it's less about we don't need a department, you know, you know, hand up um, to how are we going to get from here to there? How do we get there? So 
it, that's very heartening to hearing the different conversations because you know with more staffers and members of congress educated on what the bill is instead of an assumption of what it is that it's not <laughs> um they're i think seeing the light that all this the comprehensiveness of it is really required to to obtain a higher level of peace and to maintain it so whether or not it's in my lifetime i'm 64 now i don't know I've I've heard that uh, the next 10 years on the planet are going to be significant in us moving in that direction in in all different ways. So I'm I'm hopeful that this will happen. Uh, the conversations that I have with people that are involved in the campaign and the conversations I have with people that aren't that still just say, I don't have time for that, but I'm just so glad that you're focusing on that. So um, there is a lot of gratitude and more awareness. Uh, obviously I'd love for it to pass relatively soon. And we have people working on our committee that, that want it to pass before the end of the year. So it's, <laughs> that would be amazing. But as we continue to advocate for it, there are, um, there is progress. So it's not that we're static. There is progress with other bills passing that are important. I think this year, the conversation around uh, gun reform, common sense gun reform has shifted. More people are paying attention. Um, for me, the political system, we've got to change how we elect our people because that's a big part of it too. When we talk about the money and the propaganda, if, if uh, the electorate is not educated on some of these issues and they, they buy into the propaganda, the elected officials are going to do what they need to do to get reelected. That's just a big part of it. Um, and so when we stop, change the way we vote, um, we can make a pretty big change. So um, I'm not attached, but I, I'm just looking forward to the progress that we can experience as we go on. Nancy. Thank you. Nancy. Mm. It's a hard one. Um, we always talk about tipping points. And um, so I think as we keep on um, with what we're doing, we will reach that tipping point where um, peace is valued in our, in our country and our world and that people will see um, that's really the only way. If we don't, if we don't go forward with peace building, we may not, we may not have a planet as we see it today um we have uh, we have a lot of different bills we're also supporting uh, along the way that reflect parts of the department of peace building if you go to our website uh, dopcampaign.org you can see and sign some of the actions for these bills uh, a lot of them have to do with gun violence prevention, um, the Domestic Terrorism Prevention Act, uh, foreign policy for the 21st century, which really reflects all, all these things that we're talking about, uh, the reauthorization of the Violence Against Women Act, which passed, um, the Women's Health Protection Act. We support a lot of Voting Rights Act acts. I mean, our democracy has been under threat as the world probably watched the insurrection, the attempted insurrection last year and the hearings that are going on in Congress. Um, we have a tremendous problem with racism in this country. And uh, so we're supporting those commissions on truth, racial healing and transformation and a study of uh, reparations for um, African-Americans and uh, uh, things relating to Native Americans in this country and our horrible past with that and how to, how to come to terms with that. Um, we have justice bills we're supporting and uh, looking at the police violence issue and um, all of that relates. We have, these are all, pieces of the piece. And um, I think we just have to keep on keeping on. We have to stay hopeful. It doesn't help to be to get overwhelmed. I know it's possible to do that, but it doesn't help. And we have to, uh, we have to do it if nothing else for our children and for the generations to come after that. Absolutely. 
Well, I just wanted to add one more thing that we haven't please, mentioned. Please do get it. You know, our grassroots campaign, we've had monthly calls for quite some time, and that information is at dopcampaign.org in addition to our planning calls. But just last fall, uh, there are a number of people that just felt a little bit more urgency that have been in the conversation for a while, but it's like, let me do something. We have to move this forward. So we've probably doubled the number of people that are doing something on a weekly or monthly basis since last October. We formed a strategic planning committee, had a lot of brainstorming in the fall that uh, are in various stages of uh, being implemented now with subcommittees working on that. So uh, we have seen a, a tipping point in our own campaign, then we hope to keep seeing tipping points into larger and larger spaces and expansion and depth and breadth. So that's heartening to keep us going as well. Wonderful, wonderful. All of it is most heartening. And, and you know, it, it confirms what I always uh, tell myself that pessimism is for better times. <laughs> Where we are just now, we cannot afford that, that luxury. So I'll thank all of you and, and all that you do Thank you so much for thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the thank conversation. You.